Good day, my friends. We are back in Detroit and we are at one of my all time favorite museums. One of the coolest history museums in the United States. Hey, in the world. Henry Ford's Museum of American Innovation. Days with Jordan the Lion. It begins right now. And before you go inside, they have a big statue. Henry Ford. Definitely a guy who makes my everyday life much easier. I don't know how I would ever do this job if I didn't have my own vehicle to drive me around places. As soon as you enter the museum, you gotta love this. They have the cornerstone that was dedicated by Thomas Edison, Henry Ford's best friend. The footprints are still up there, his signature's up there, and the shovel's still in the concrete. First car we're looking at is Ronald Reagan's 1972 Lincoln Limo. Steel limousine first used by President Nixon provided refuge for Ronald Reagan in 1981 after he was shot by would-be assassin John Hinckley. Like all presidential cars, after President Kennedy's assassination, it's completely armored, closed car with permanent roof and bulletproof glass. Pretty cool collection we're gonna see today. 1981, that was the year I was born. Just give you a view of the whole car. Of course they rushed him into it, get him to the hospital. Katie has found the one of the most famous pieces here, the Kennedy limo. People always like to comment and say basically there's nothing original left of this car that they took it all down to nothing for the investigation. That's the car. Our president, President John F. Kennedy, was shot while traveling in a motorcade in this car in Dallas, supposedly by Lee Harvey Oswald. Here's a picture of him. We'll go over and match up the side he was on. It says, modern, new four-door convertible seemed well-suited to a young, forward-thinking president. A tragedy struck when President Kennedy was assassinated in November of 1963 while riding in this car through the streets of Dallas, Texas. 1961 Lincoln. Right here. Katie, isn't this mind-blowing to see? We have a photo right behind us of earlier in the day, obviously, of JFK going through the streets of Dallas and he's out of the side up through the sunroof. In that photo, he's right here. You can see right over here, he's on that side, but then he would be on the other side when Jackie was in the car. Right there. Whew. Just makes it feel way too real. Then of course, that image of Jackie crawling out of the back of it. And down here at the very bottom, Katie was pointing out to me where it says that it's been repainted because President Johnson um, said the rubber tires were damaged and President Johnson insisted that the entire car be painted black. So it was originally at that time, that's why people kind of question whether this was the real car or not because the car that Kennedy's in was blue at the time. And they have a whole freaking McDonald's set up in here with a big giant sign. But on the other side of this display, they have a diner inside of that train car. There's a Studebaker, 1951 Studebaker, Lammy's Diner. We're kind of hungry. In other words, you can check it out inside the train car. We got ourselves a couple of drinks, ordered our food. Thank you. You're welcome. Enjoy. Thank you. 
had a very limited menu, but what was on their menu I had to go for. Sloppy Joe. I love the heavily decorated wagons from before cars. They're showing here early public transportation. Over here we have Dwight D. Eisenhower's Bubble Top 1950 Lincoln. Said it was a stylish car to see and be seen in. Says it was a new era and the old fleet of presidential cars was looking decidedly out of date. President Truman first rode this flashy convertible after it was delivered to the White House along with nine closed limousines in 1950. President Eisenhower later had the car fitted out with a removable plexiglass top that allowed him to see and be seen in bad weather. Soon became the bubble top was what it was known for. Yeah, he loved to pop out of there and wave to people. Very cool. Look at that. That is pretty awesome. This was also John F. Kennedy's presidential car until the 1961 Lincoln was delivered. And look at this. Another presidential car. The Sunshine Special. 1939 Lincoln Franklin Roosevelt. FDR says the White House staff sent five pages of special instructions with the order this new presidential vehicle. A world war was looming and added security was crucial. Even more security features were added in 1942 after Pearl Harbor was bombed. They made it Also, taking into consideration that his legs had become paralyzed, so they needed the uh, doors to be a little bit bigger. Pretty cool car. They do have a picture of FDR in the car, sitting in this car. Kind of a close-up. See, he's in it right there. That is Teddy Roosevelt's carriage, 1902 Broham. An elegant carriage for the rich and powerful. President Roosevelt was not fond of automobiles and very rarely used one. He preferred the old-fashioned style of horse-drawn carriage for public parades and outings. This luxurious Broham, or Brome, maybe it says, two passengers could sit in privacy inside with a coachman out front that drove the horses. It was designed closer to the ground than most carriages so passengers could easily get in and out. Wow. Hard top, look at this. They got a holiday in display. They have a steam locomotive over here. They also have one here that would pull everything else that was like coaches, which I think that is really interesting and fascinating to see. It's an Allegheny steam engine, the largest of its time. They used it for military purposes, for transporting troops and military equipment. But once diesel became the thing, they retired all of them they had made. You can actually go up there and walk through it. So this one you'll notice it has several different names on it. Like right here it says the president. That was its final name that they gave it naming it after President Herbert Hoover. But before that, it was named Sam Hill, which you'll see right over here, who was one of Henry Ford's main mechanics that would work on this. But this actually was a, a train car that they used to haul the presidential party to the opening of this museum. And then the train car was retired after that. So they actually have the car, they actually have the 
caboose to where you can get up there and kind of look inside. National Historic Vehicle Register. This car, the 1952 Hornet, is now part of it, it says. Has a 1931 Bugatti Royale. That is a Duesenberg Model J. Duesenberg built only 481 Model Js between 1920-1935. No two are identical because independent coach builders crafted each body to the buyer's specific specifications. Is it the world's finest car? One thing is certain, the Model J will always be in the running. The 1956 Continental Mark II. William Clay Ford revives a tradition of excellence. One of the very first cars. 1899 Duria. Trap. Cars of this era usually look like squarish, horse drawn buggies. Charles Duria was inspired by more graceful curves of a Victorian carriage. It says this was Henry Ford's wife's car. 1914 Detroit Electric Model 47. Therefore, drove this Detroit Electric. In the years before World War I, many women chose electric cars because they started instantly without hand cranking and had no difficult to shift transmission. So the superintendent of the Detroit Electric Factory employed his daughter Lillian Reynolds to sell to women, including Clara Ford, who drove this car into the 1930s. Very cool. Here's the Edsel, of course. Edsel Ford, one of the Ford family members. This was his brainchild. They're saying on here that wise guys used to say that this car looked like a Buick sucking a lemon. <laughs> they did not like the throwback body style. 1958 car looking like kind of a 30s car, they said. School bus, anyone? Wow, 1927 school bus. And it actually says, huh, this could be the oldest surviving American school bus. How about that? If you lived in Fort Valley, Georgia, you might have arrived to school in this bus. I had not seen this the last time I was here. I didn't make it back to this corner, but Katie and I were looking at some cars and I saw this and I go, Wait a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute, on the road. I go, is this Charles Corral's car? Oh yeah, baby. That was what he toured around in some of the time. Look at that, right there on the left. That is so cool. Novel idea, when Charles Corral's boss said yes, either imagine that on the road would last 27 years. This is the last of several motorhomes that carried a three-man TV crew on America's back roads where they took time to meet people, listen to yarns, and feel the seasons change. The show featured Kuralt's superbly crafted stories about ordinary people who were often quite extraordinary. Here's a photo of the inside that said the crew modified the interior, creating secured storage for their equipment and film. They never stayed overnight in the motorhome. It was just serving as a rolling studio. This is so cool to see. This is so cool. Because Charles Corral was like the early version of a travel vlogger, really. Even before Hill Hauser. Charles Corral was out there doing what I'm doing, just going everywhere, meeting anyone that he wants to meet, and sharing his stories and sharing those people with the world. Jerry Unser Motor Company, owned by Bobby Unser. Famous race family. This is really cool. This 1935 stagecoach travel trailer was a gift from Henry Ford to his pal Charles Lindbergh in 1942. An American hero famous for making his first solo nonstop flight across the Atlantic. Charles and his wife Anne used it as a home on the road and as a spare room and study at home. Anne wrote The Steep Ascent here. And Charles wrote portions of his Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Spirit of St. Louis. Inside here. How about that? Bobby Unser's race car. How do you win the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb 
19 in a row, 19 years. You can see this display. You have it going uphill. That is driver Bobby Unser's car for the Pikes Peak races. It says this is what's left of the worst crash in Indy 500 history. First lap of the 1973 race, David Walter's car hit the outside wall, exploded and overturned. Walter suffered burns and injuries to his hands, but he recovered and returned to the race in 1974. Dang. Whew. Lucky dude. It's kind of cool. This is Trevor Bain's car. He was the youngest racer to ever win Daytona 500. It's a day after his 20th birthday in 2011. And if you look at it, you can still see all the confetti that was thrown on the car and Coca-Cola that was sprayed all over the car. That's kept it, made it stick. Signed by him and the pit crew. So this car's pretty interesting. This is the 1901 Ford Sweepstakes. When Henry Ford first started an auto company, it failed. And he ended up rebuilding the company by this car. Helped him win a race that helped him finance the second auto company. Which he left a few months later, started his third, and that became the one that was successful. He was using it to promote the company name. This is the car that Barney Oldfield raced. <laughs> this was the 999. Other people were afraid to drive their own machine so they'd hire a fearless driver and he was the guy for this one. Barney Oldfield, he's a professional bicycle racer. Said although he'd never driven a car, Oldfield not only mastered it but also won his first race. Went on to become America's first nationally known racing hero. There he is in that car. 1919 Model T Ford. Here's a 56 Thunderbird with an old toll booth right there. A little cool display. That is the first van camper. 1959 Volkswagen Westphalia. Here's the 1986 Ford Taurus. They're saying that people wanted something more futuristic looking, so they came up with this. And it was so futuristic looking that when they made Robocop, these were what they used for the futuristic looking cop cars. This is one of my favorite parts of the museum. This room is all dedicated to the Declaration of Independence. And they talk about how, when it was originally written, they had 200 exact copies made for educational purposes, exactly replicating the size, everything. Now only 30 exist, and this is one of the 30. You can see John Hancock's signature right there. Famous signature. Here on display, they have a combination portable writing desk and copying press from 1787 that they attribute to the invention of Thomas Jefferson. Over here in this section it says, by the end of the Revolutionary War, no man was more admired than George Washington. He had proven that he cared more for his men, cared more for himself, than he cared more for himself. To his troops and officers, then to the cheering crowds lining the streets, Washington was a hero. These are all part of his campsite. From 1783, as the war wound down, Washington used this mess kit, specially made for him in New York and New England. There's his bed. How crazy is that? Folding camping bed of George Washington. Would he use this between 1775 and 1780? It says this would have been the Speaker of the Supreme Court, Speaker's Chair, in 1790. Wow, very, very early days of our country. There's a Civil War drum. That's the famous chair. Ford's Theater. 
chair that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in. You can see all the discoloration, everything. God, can you imagine? The chair that he was shot in by John Wilkes Booth. Then they actually have glass on both sides, so you can see both sides. And of course, after he was shot, they took him across the street and he lied there until he died. So there he is in his deathbed. Of course, they were looking for John Wilkes Booth. This to me is just one of the most interesting things you can see in American history in a museum and then to think that it's in the same place with the Kennedy limo, kind of mind blowing. So now they have another really amazing piece of history we have to show you in this same area. But then what changed it all? Rosa Parks. The Rosa Parks bus. The Montgomery City bus. She is buried in Detroit. So that's why it's here, I think. That's why it's here. I mean, I don't know if Henry Ford made arrangements or how that all worked, but she's buried here. And they do allow you to go on the bus. You can enter the bus, enter in the back, take your photo in that exact seat. So all the front seats, of course, were whites only. And when Rosa Parks went to sit down, she sat here, which was still a whites only seat. So the bus driver was actually the one that made a big deal and was wanting her to move. So it's that seat right there. Katie's sitting in the seat right now. Of the seat where the Negro passengers uh, take as they on this route. The driver noted that the front of the bus was filled with white passengers and there would be uh, two or three men standing. He looked back and yeah. asked like right. the seat where I had taken along with three other persons, one in the seat with me and two across the aisle seated. He demanded the seat that we were occupying. The other passengers very reluctantly gave up that seat, but I refused to do so. The driver said that if I refused to leave the seat, he would have to call the police, and I told him to call the police, which he did, and when they, they came, they placed me under arrest. We're gonna get off the back now. Including a colored only drinking fountain. I love this. This is an exploded Model T. It shows you exactly how they were put together. Here they have Henry's assembly line. So this is a kiosk from the IBM Pavilion of the 1964 New York World's Fair. Interesting. Wow. It says that this table right here and the side chair belong to Abraham Lincoln. Both of these. The table beneath the painting of Mark Twain was actually owned by Mark Twain. That was his table. This was a portable writing desk of Edgar Allan Poe's. So this desk right here, this is a card table owned by John Hancock. 
This is Henry Ford's violin collection. He liked to collect fiddles. And good ones too. <laughs> Says he moved to Detroit and focused on building a successful automobile company. But by the mid 1920s, he wanted to pick up an old habit, playing the fiddle again. So he went shopping for some violins, but not just any fiddles. He wanted the best violins he could afford. So this is one of my favorite parts of the museum also. I was telling Katie about they have all kinds of interesting invention type things and nods to inventors but right here where they have Edison's bust if you don't know about it you could very easily miss it right here in this little vial right there they even have a description of what it is Thomas Edison's last breath Thomas Edison was Henry Ford's hero as well as his friend during Edison's final illness a rack of test tubes was close to his bedside Upon his death, Edison's son Charles had them sealed with paraffin wax. He sent one to Henry Ford, knowing their close relationship. It's one of several electrical switches that was used to connect the generators at Thomas Edison's house. So right here they have a model of the Pearl Street Station power station that Edison was living in. And that's what those that generator switch would have been used there and here they don't have the bulb itself but they do have the socket with the switch right there for a light bulb over here they have a bust of nikola tesla also credit is inventing the electrical motor now i want to show you the dimaxian house way of living of the future if the future were 1946 Good luck, or good news, open house today. We're gonna to take you on a tour of that house right now. Let's do it. Don't be scared. <laughs> Buy a round house, it's a smart thing to do. Here's an overhead view of what we're gonna see. 1,017 square feet of living space. Oh, wow. Uh-huh, told ya. <laughs> Nobody ever trusts me until how do we get in here? So I guess we can't walk inside. But you can see all the way around it, inside. It's a pretty cool living space. That takes up about two thirds of it, what we've seen. I thought before you were allowed to get in and walk around, but I guess not. Still a very cool experience. A doorway. Oh, and you can see that's where you would have slept. When you walk in, that's where you put your clothes. Walk in there. The original yellow band wiener. The wiener rolling down the road. Coming to a town near you. The 1952 Wienermobile. A true classic. They have a real, a real uh, stringent way of picking who they go with. You have to have like a degree and all that stuff when they hire somebody to drive that thing around now. I had a friend of mine try to do it. <laughs> it says, 1936 Oscar Mayer company began to promote their hot dogs in the streets of Chicago with the very first Wienermobile. The only 1952 model in its original design, the Wienermobile, in our collection serves as a prototype for Oscar Mayer's more recent 1988 fleet. Awesome. I'm cool with that. I don't know where the hell you'd park it, but... Look good at a stadium. And the lyrics to the Oscar Mayer Wiener song. And they have a little metal plate that you can do your own rubbing. <laughs> your own little souvenir. Over here we have a cotton bale. And they have a microscope in this glass case right here. Used by George Washington Carver. Carver's the first African American to earn an advanced degree in agricultural science. He used this microscope in his laboratory at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. 
helped him document the cellular structure of sweet potatoes, peanuts, other crops that nurtured the soil and could be converted into industrial products. And he was actually a good friend of Henry Ford's. Look over here, we found the flight section. It's the number one Fokker. Oh, come on, grow up. It says it right there. Josephine Ford Expedition. Oh, look at this. Guy doing aerial tricks or that lady. Jeez, that's crazy. Flying over the fair. Oh, it's a cool simulator. Look at that. So we're supposed to be getting on board with that guy. Get motion sick. That is awesome. You chicken, you can get up here. <laughs> She's afraid to fly, I think. <laughs> Boy, somebody calls Scott Michaels, Hilton sisters, the Wright brothers. Look at this little camera set up showing the first flight. They went to all the trouble of giving it its own freaking room. We should at least kind of give you the experience of it, I think. Forever the first, it says. 1903. The Wright Brothers. They actually have, you know, since the Wright Brothers started with a cycle company, they have one of their cycles here. And here in Greenfield Village, they also have one of the cycle shops. Here they're talking about Bill Boeing making a fortune in the lumber industry and then wanting to get into aviation. This was Henry Ford's personal airplane, although he only flew a handful of times in his life, according to Charles Lindbergh, so that he acknowledged that airplanes belonged to another generation and that they were a part of the future. It just wasn't what he liked. Plus, apparently, you know, he was a big fan of traveling in cars. Well, my friends, we will finish it off with Henry Ford's attempt at airplanes. They called this the Model T of the Sky, the 1926 Ford Flyver. <laughs> A Ford Fliver. Hope you all enjoyed our tour of the Henry Ford Museum today in Detroit. Have a great night and goodbye.